Professor Walt Rostow has written a new book. It is called Politics and the Stages of Growth. It is, as one would expect from the title, the application of the concepts of Mr. Rostow worked up in his earth shaking the stages of economic growth into politics. The book will be widely noticed because Mr. Rostow fusses with super important matters in his struggle to explain the nature of social and economic evolution and to anticipate their direction. Mr. Rostow, although he has given most of his life to the pursuit of scholarship, is a committed advocate. He went to Yale, then to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, then to war in the OSS. He has taught economics and history in Oxford and Cambridge. And then he settled down at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1950, where he taught for 11 years, and where finally his instinct for self-survival failed him. It is recorded in a biography of Mr. Rostow that in 1942, serving in the OSS and taking passage in a British ship, uh, the ship was torpedoed by a Nazi submarine. Mr. Rostow managed to survive. Bill, I was in a plane. Oh, was that a plane? It was just my trunk that was lost. Oh, but not, not his luggage, I was about to say, which descended to the vasty deep. And about the same applies to MIT. Uh, I'm not lost, my igloo's lost, you know. <laughs> I'm hey, here. you're interrupting me. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a stage of economic growth? <laughs> anyway, after the war, Mr. Rostow persuaded the Congress of the United States to pass a private relief bill awarding Mr. Rostow $588 to compensate him for his lost luggage. <laughs> <laughs> when the Lyndon Johnson administration was torpedoed, <laughs> Mr. Rostow had made no such provision to protect himself from the depredations of his colleagues. Using excuses, they declined to let him back into the faculty in punishment for his having supported the Vietnam War effort. MIT does not believe in extending academic freedom to the ludicrous length of permitting a scholar to hold views different from those of Benjamin Spock. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Rostow came to the University of Texas where he has been happily productive uh, and sits many hours a week at the LBJ Library, whence ultimately the materials will issue to enable history to make the judgment, is Lyndon Johnson defensible? I should like to begin by asking Mr. Rostow whether he has examined the sentimental ties which understandably bind him to Mr. Johnson, are you, in other words, able to say with confidence that your defense of Mr. Johnson's policies is not critically influenced by your links to Mr. Johnson and through him to those policies? I think I can say that my views about Asia, from which derive my views about Vietnam, were formed uh, long before I had the privilege of working with President Johnson. In the 1950s, when I was at MIT, I uh, did a study of China and a, uh, a book on American policy in Asia, <coughs> in which uh, it was my duty to think through uh, the nature of the American interest in Asia, past, present, and future, uh, the kinds of problems that were likely to arise. And it was out of that a great opportunity in academic tranquility, if you like, to try to think through these problems, that I came up with certain settled views about the American interest in Asia. So the answer is no. The answer is that uh, I hold my uh, views uh, about Asia, from which derive my support for President Kennedy and President Johnson, and, uh, uh, and for what they stood for in our policy, mm -hmm. and uh, my affection for President Johnson, which is great and real, is quite independent of that. Uh-huh. Now, um, may I ask you this, uh, Mr. Rostow? There, there are a great many people who defend the commitments of Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Johnson, but um, who say that they were made in what we now know uh, is an ignorance of the American temperament, and that under the circumstances, whatever it was that you hoped to achieve uh, in that part of the world, the, the cost uh, in the fissure in America is too great, and that under the circumstances, you ought to have proceeded differently. I ask you two questions. Is this 
a concession that Mr. Johnson is prepared to make as he looks back on his own career, and a separate question, is it a concession that you are prepared to make? President Johnson can speak for himself. And, uh, no, we know his that. Book will be out, his book will be out soon, and uh, I urge you all to read it. Uh, my own view is that the costs that we have borne, which are multiple, real, uh, in a uh, matter of this kind have to be weighed against the alternatives. Now, if there was a cheap and easy way uh, by which the American interest in Asia could be protected cheaply, uh, uh, surely no one suggested it to either President Kennedy or President Johnson. And surely if it existed, they would have grabbed it because they had the most profound personal, political, and other interests mm -hmm. in not engaging American military power in Southeast Asia. But I'm surprised you said that because a, a while ago, uh, a, a na National Review published uh, a series of papers as though they had been written during that period. And various, various people who are alive and accessible, who when asked, um, did you write that particular paper, said, well, gosh, I don't know. Uh, I, I might very well have. You know, people like Dean Rusk and, uh, uh, and um, <laughs> uh, others. Now, this would suggest that there were some people around saying to Mr. Johnson in 1963, 1964, if you do this, you've got to do it uh, decisively. Um, are you yourself, for instance, are on record as saying that you should have done something when the 1962 Laos Treaty was brazenly... Yes, I've respect. said I believe the greatest mistake of the 60s was not to act decisively at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, wh whatever whatever the, what do you define by acting decisively? Well, it, whatever it, it took to do the job, and whatever it, it took to do the job would certainly have been less than what it in fact took us when we went in in extremis. Uh, that is to say... Uh, uh, you Tough had a military action. Instantly. Well, you may not have needed it at that time. You've got to remember that at the end of 62, uh, things had been slowly improving uh, in 62. Uh, 62 was the year that uh, the communists referred to as your year. And uh, uh, Wilfred Burchett has said that, among others. And the, uh, if you had used the full weight of American military and diplomatic power in the wake of the understanding that uh, had been achieved between Harriman and Pushkin in Geneva, the Soviet ambassador Pushkin, which was that the Soviets would take responsibility for the uh, compliance of Hanoi and the path at Lao to this. And you would create a, a, a Laos that would be like a Finland. Well, I, I think if you'd done it freshly and, and held their feet to the fire on this, you had a fair chance of not having a war at all. Uh, but in any case, uh, my fear at the time uh, was that if we didn't act decisively, then uh, we'd act in a waning situation and it'd be later and more expensive. But the point is that uh, I think that the reason that President Kennedy didn't is highly understandable in terms of American history. Here, he had, uh, the situation was slowly improving. Those who were thoughtful knew it was still precarious at the end of 62. They were still in the situation filtering. where it was improving. In it was South certainly Vietnam. not improving in South Vietnam. Yes, in 62, yes, the end of 62. Well, when were they burning each other? Uh, in, that began in May 63 at Hue, and it, that was the beginning of the downturn. And the military effects, the political effects, started to be felt in May, and the military effects of the political disintegration were felt about July. Mm -hmm. And the latter half of 63 was disintegration. But uh, the point is that it is a very deep uh, tradition in democracy, which Tocqueville noted in democracy in America, that democracies tend uh, to wait until they are in extreme military situation before they do react. It was awfully hard from a standing start to make a major crisis because of men were still illegally coming down some obscure trails in Laos. And I can understand uh, President Kennedy's view, and uh, uh, besides which he had just taken the world safely through a rather hair-raising crisis over the Cuban Missiles. So um, it was a time when I think he rather sort of counted his blessings and hoped this one would improve. <clears throat> Nevertheless, in retrospect, I, I must say that uh, it was, uh, it is my judgment that that was the biggest mistake of the 60s in Southeast Asia. Well, if, uh, 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 how much attention do you pay, if any, uh, to the assertion that foreign policy, in order to be successful, has got to express in some sense the temperamental limitations 
of the people who wage that policy. Uh, taking extremes, uh, we know, for instance, that, um, let's say, China uh, can wage different kinds of wars from, say, um, um, us or, or England or, or, or even France. Now, uh, ca ca do, can you now look back to the time when you were counseling President Johnson and say, uh, damn, I wish, I wish I had warned against policies that uh, permitted the elongation of a war to the point that it ran up against the bedrock of American impatience and therefore became impossible to pursue? Well, I, I, there's no doubt that, that uh, both President Kennedy and President Johnson had strongly in their minds the, the rather miserable experience of President uh, Truman in Korea. And uh, if you watch the curve in American public opinion polls of those who say it was you know, a mistake to enter Korea, it was a mistake to engage troops in Vietnam, the curve went up faster and higher in Korea. And uh, President Kennedy and President Johnson made their difficult decisions on, the, uh, on the, the basis of our experience there and with a consciousness that this would put great strains on American uh, public opinion. Now, uh, I think that uh, when historians look at the polls and look at the history, they'll find that down to Tet, the American people were irritated and frustrated by a very slow-moving war, but on balance, uh, they were uh, staying with it. And, and, uh, and the great irony of this story is going to be that the Tet Offensive, as it was interpreted in the United States, uh, brought about the turning point. Because it, the, it's an irony because it was uh, a tremendous setback for the other side militarily in, in Vietnam, and a tremendous setback politically because of the reaction of the South Vietnamese who mobilized an extra quarter of a million people and so on. But uh, we did. Uh, it was upsetting here for a complex of reasons, and uh, it did change the balance of public opinion. Um, you know, are, you, are you saying that if it hadn't been for Tet, uh, people uh, in America would have been perfectly prepared to continue the war at the tempo of late 1967 or early 1968 right into the present time? Well, the tempo of the war, uh, was very much determined by the outcome of Ted. It began to fall away as a war uh, because of the other side's incapacity from Ted on. It gradually subsides in terms of the, the level of combat, uh, uh, which has made it possible to pull out a lot of American forces and still uh, uh, even extend the, the government's Russia, capacity. You are being evasive. <laughs> What's your that, question? Well, I'm saying if they hadn't been Ted, I, I know what happened after Ted, but if they hadn't been Ted, uh, are you saying that um, uh, America is the kind of country that can wage a pre-Tet type of war more or less indefinitely? No, it wasn't. Well, uh, no. I think that uh, uh, you remember, though, that the prediction of Westmoreland in November 67 before Tet is that within two years we might begin to pull troops out. That was the whole objective. And uh, Johnny Johnson, who was then chief of staff of the Army, said the same thing in an interview in U.S. News and World Report. So the prospect was not for the continuation indefinitely of the same war. The prospect was that uh, either we'd apply military power in a decisive way, or you'd be able to pull some troops out. And, uh, and I have no illusions. I'm perfectly clear what the pain was uh, of trying to conduct a war in which you had great inhibitions on the use of power because the president was trying to take no risks of a larger war. And it was slow and protracted. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's very hard to, as always in history, to reconstruct uh, something without a major event. But if you, uh, if you just project the curve of 67 on mm -hmm. without Ted, uh, the, the projection was we'd begin to be able to pull troops out. Now, and we did, just about the time that Westy said we would. Yeah. Now, the failure to act more conclusively, to use your term, yes. uh, in 1962, as I understand it, was based on the fear that certain treaties or certain understandings existed uh, between North Vietnam uh, and, and China. Now, you, as a student of, of the Far East, were undoubtedly consulted on the question of the likelihood that those treaties existed. Are you free to say what you replied when asked? Uh, I don't remember. You remember, we got to remember, I was in the State Department from the end of 61 to 66. and. Uh, I didn't attend a meeting with the president on Southeast Asia from roughly December 61 till Honolulu, February of 66, just before I went into the White House. 
And I, I don't ever remember that question being put to me. Uh, we discussed the, the conditions under which China might come into the war, yes. Uh, but you ask me a question, the answer is no. I don't I was never asked that question to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, recently, Professor Schlesinger uh, wrote that um, with the opening of diplomatic relations, or de facto of diplomatic relations with uh, the Chinese, uh, it is impossible to sustain an argument in defense of our current actions in South Vietnam. Do you find it impossible? Uh, I don't know what uh, uh, Professor Schlesinger said, so I'll just state my own view. Uh, my own view is that uh, if we are, t and I say this in the book, incidentally, which was written before ping pong diplomacy and trips to presidential trips to Peking. I do believe that a set of forces inside China are moving mainland China to focus on its own economic and social development. I do believe that the pressure of the Soviet visions on its frontier and the example of Japan uh, are having a profound effect on their policy. I believe that there is a fair chance that they will concentrate on uh, the, um, their own delayed economic and social development in the generation ahead, unless we tempt them beyond bearing by pulling our forces out of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything that is more likely to upset the um, stabilization, uh, the, this movement towards China coming out into the world in a normal way than a convulsive American movement out of Southeast Asia, among other things. They would have to move in to keep the Russians from moving in. The Russians are already trying to get ports at Singapore. And um, just as uh, Scotty Reston's interview with Zhou Enlai revealed that Zhou Enlai understands very well that if we pull out of Asia, one of the first effects is going to be that the Japanese go nuclear. And he openly discussed that dilemma. And the New York Times uh, had the wit to pick it up and write a editorial about it, which is in a quite different mood than its editorials usually on Asia. Namely, that a, a convulsive pull out of the United States from Asia would produce a, a nuclear Japan and something the Chinese don't want. And I believe that a convulsive pull out of Southeast Asia would lead to uh, the unhinging of that area and to a larger war fairly soon. Do you want a, a nuclear Japan? No, I do not. Why not? I think that it's, uh, there are two reasons. The first is that uh, I believe that the, the less atom bombs, the better. The less fingers on the trigger, the better. It's just a straight human thing. But there are other reasons as well. That uh, you have now a curious situation in the world in which a number of countries, I wouldn't say 10 or 5 or 15, but a good many have jockeyed themselves up to the nuclear threshold. Technically, you mean? Technically. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it's a matter of months before they go nuclear. I don't know what it would take the Indians to produce a nuclear weapon. They have an excellent nuclear establishment, but you measure it in months, not years. Mm -hmm. And so with the Japanese, the Germans, the Swedes, a whole lot of folks. It's not very difficult. There are treaty problems, aren't they, involving the Japanese? Or, or do we waive those? Well, but it, you, the, the non-proliferation treaty has a... No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our, our, our peace treaty. Uh, yes, there are, there are problems in the Constitution, but uh, so there's also a, the Supreme National Interest Clause in the Non-Proliferation mm -hmm. Treaty operates uh, well, like the Self-Defense Clause in the uh, United Nations Charter. False if, measure. Uh, that, that is to say, uh, if the United States is going to prove an unreliable ally mm -hmm. and, is not, and is not going to meet its commitments, then these nations have a very grave problem of protecting themselves. In the is that system. sanctioned by law, international law? I think that if, you know, you had a complete uh, return to isolation in the United States, it would be recognized that a, a number of countries that are not now nuclear uh, would, under the United Nations Charter, uh, under uh, uh, the, uh, their self-defense, have have, be able to move in this direction, and it would be accepted. Okay. So beyond the reason that you just, the fewer fingers, the better with nuclear triggers, no, you, say, you say that it now becomes technically feasible for a lot of people right. to... Well, uh, well, my second point would be that it would be profoundly destabilizing. First, uh, you'd have a very precarious period in, you know, what would China do, what would Russia do? Mm -hmm. The other problem is that if a, if a nation has nuclear weapons and claims the right to fire them, it ine inevitably dilutes the American alliance. Uh, we, one thing an American president and 
is not going to do is to let another nation uh, put us in a position of nuclear jeopardy without intimate consultation. Uh, and uh, so that you tend uh, thereby to dilute and fragment the, the alliances of the world and make the world a lot more unstable and precarious. Well, now, <clears throat> um, of course, you touch on that, that fascinating problem in, in, in your book, uh, and you use, you use frequently the term regionalization. Now, wh why, why does it destabilize the world to have a situation in which China's uh, atom bombs have got to be offset by stuff that comes out of Omaha, Nebraska, instead of by stuff that could conceivably come out of Tokyo, uh, especially uh, if, uh, if there is the possibility always of, of a diplomacy that would tend to call for other than, 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 than worldwide nuclear confrontations? Well, I think that uh, the answer is that the American nuclear establishment is a more effective deterrent than anyone is going to be able to uh, gin up in Asia in a reasonably short period of time. The other is that the hope of the world is, is that we move not in the direction of nuclear proliferation, but towards a success in the salt talks and a gradual withering away of the importance of national nuclear capabilities. Now, uh, it was not accidental. As a result of the internalization of concerns that, that you speak about in the book and so on. That's right, and as people realize that uh, there really isn't, as I say at the end, uh, one of the lessons of history is that there... It really, doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's yeah. one of the biggest things about it. Yeah. And folks are going to maybe get that idea. And uh, the nuclear issue might wither away, especially if you get into arm. That's the hope, at least, in the world. And it's a decent... It's a hope uh, it's not uh, going to come automatically to pass, but it's not an impossible one. And, uh, for example, as Soviet diplomats say, it was not accidental that uh, <coughs> Premier Kosygin sent a message to President Johnson agreeing uh, to move forward on the SALT talks when, on the occasion of the signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, there is no formal relationship by law, international law between the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the SALT talks. Mm -hmm. But there is, in fact, an understanding that if the United States and the Soviet Union are going to prove incapable of some kind of taming of this beast and, and uh, setting a ceiling on the arms race, and if uh, the other nations of the world are not going to behave like lesser breeds without the law, so that the success in the movement towards arms control in Soviet Union with the Soviet Union is, I think, an essential long-run condition for making a success out of a world of non-proliferation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's impossible. I, don't not, I, I know it's not for sure, but it's uh, mankind's best hope. And I don't want to see us callously uh, uh, accept the kind of argument, which I fully understand you put to me as a question, well, why not let uh, the Europeans deter the Russians in Europe and the Japanese look after the Japanese and the Indians? Uh, these are, I've seen too many situations where uh, I think if they had the weapons in these regional areas, they might use them. Uh, and I'd much rather s see if we can't take this other road of the success of the SALT talks and a world of non-proliferation. The moral is the dangerous toys should not be given to little boys. No, the answer is the big boys had better behave like big boys, yeah. or the, they, the, the other fellows will get them. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> apropos this uh, sort of metaphysical optimism that, that you feel, uh, as your, your, your thesis has been uh, uh, expressed variously and, and, and very eloquently, and it is, in a sense, conservative. Uh, if, if conservatism is the politics of realism, than what, what you are. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a stolen base there? <clears throat> then then in, a, in a sense, you're saying that uh, uh, things have happened and necessarily will happen to the Soviet Union, which will cause it to reorder its concerns in the course of which there's bound to be an ideological lesion uh, and some of that old, hard, implacable stuff that resulted in wars atrocities will dissipate. Now, this morning in the New York Times, a very small item, small presumably because it came in too late to make large, 
uh, Mr. Reston comes back from China and gives a speech in which the following sentence is quoted. I am a Scotch Calvinist and I believe in redemption. And uh, having come back from China, I'm committed to the proposition that uh, the people there are trying to make the best, to get the best out of man. Now this, this seems a, 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 a startling statement unless things are going on in China, uh, which we do do not know, things of, of extraordinary moral magnitude. And since you are a close student of the area, can you either explain Mr. Reston's statement in context of what is going on in China, or tell us what it is that he discovered in China that would have justified it? Well, I haven't been to China. I've followed uh, China as closely as I could now since uh, 1953, almost 20 years. Uh, I think I would guess that someone coming to China now would find uh, uh, some quite uh, agreeable things beneath the surface of this fantastic uh, 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 police state, which it is, and uh, uh, beneath the uniformity of everyone with the red book. And the reason I would put a little uh, in somewhat different terms than Mr. Reston apparently did, because I didn't see his article. The Chinese have gone through since 1958, and that's uh, something like 13, 14 years, a most extraordinary passage of history. First, they had the Great Leap Forward, and that failed. And in the course of it, it became, that was the time when the break came with Russia. And they had a most miserable period uh, with real hunger and uh, fall in the population in the early 60s. Then they moved back and recovered till about 1965, and immediately in the wake of the failure in Indonesia, they went into the Cultural Revolution, which was a fantastic uh, passage in political history, and it was a little as though the President of the United States had organized the SDS on a mass basis to destroy the bureaucracy and the both political parties. And, uh, well, that disturbed things so that the army moved in and the moderates about starting 67, 68. Now, You've had since 68, 69, a period of moderation in internal life. Uh, the beginnings of the serious work, again, on the economy, which had been almost postponed for 10 years, and the beginning of, moderniz of uh, some moderation in foreign policy. I quote in uh, that book uh, a, from a big Cultural Revolution poster that, uh, uh, by a former minister of culture who describes what he and his group were anti-Mao were trying to achieve. They, they said they want a world of, uh, where China will conduct rational economic policies and mothers can put their infants to bed in the cradles without nightmare. Now, something like that has begun to happen relatively to the Cultural Revolution and the passions and romanticism of the Great Leap Forward in the last two, three years. And I should think uh, people are feeling better and are nicer to each other. And, mm -hmm. Things are quieted down. All of the conflicts are not over. There are a lot of provincial quarrels about where do the old uh, Cultural Revolution fellows stand vis-a-vis -vis the party fellows, vis-a-vis -vis the military. But it's a, it's a better time in China than it's been. Mm -hmm. And I would hope, I have a, his, as a historian a great compassion for the story of China since 1842 and the Opium Wars. And they've had a harder time adjusting to modern modernization than any other nation. It's, a, you know, it's more than a century, and they haven't yet come to terms with how you do it. But they may be coming now, and uh, if so, that's great. And if so long as we don't uh, do something to upset the po a power balance in which they are counting on us, in my judgment, the Chinese do not want us to leave Asia. Well, but um, I know when you say that we shouldn't do something to upset the power balance, you're saying, that, you know, let's not whisk our troops out of South Vietnam or a Southeast Asia. Uh, let's not or, uh, or throw the Korea Japan area into right. Or let's not go into the military. The song or whatever, but uh, w wouldn't you, as, as as a strategist and as a historian, acknowledge that uh, uh, in the American situation, it is also to throw us off balance, to think things about China which are unrealistic, even uh, as it threw England off balance to think things about Hitler, yes. which proved to be uh, unrealistic. Now, well, when, when the premier correspondent of the Western world. Uh, comes back about a country uh, which has uh, 
slaughtered somewhere between 20 and 40 million people in the course of uh, giving flesh to the thoughts of Chairman Mao. Uh, and it says, uh, I have just come back from a country that is seeking to bring the best out of people. Uh, is, isn't something like that as uh, immobilizing as the loss of at least 10 divisions? I haven't read Mr. Eston's column, but uh, I think the people of the country are a lot more sensible. Uh, there's a long... Then, then, <laughs> then to listen to him, you mean? I think that's right. I think that people uh, have a sense that, uh, of that, you know, they've been through this. Mussolini made the trains run on time, and, uh, you know, the Hitler Jugend looked really pretty good, and the economy was reviving, and the Germans were gathering their self-respect. and, and uh, I forget who it was that came back and announced, I've seen the future. Was that the Webbs when they went first to the Soviet Union? But we've had a long history of people going and, and, it works, it, yeah. and uh, seeing a, a totalitarian system operate and it, uh, seeing the cleanliness of the streets and the, uh, the people and the trains run on time and they're treated nicely. But I think the, our people as a whole uh, know that uh, it's not quite that simple. On Mr. the other Marstad, hand... But the point, the point is, I, you, you, I, I think you, you, you favor to attach sufficient gravity to this because uh, we, we know, you know what boob bait is as <coughs> dished out by Mussolini, as dished out by Hitler. But we're talking now about some, one of the putatively most sophisticated observers in America. Now, if you, if you can say, look, uh, on top of taking out his appendix, they did a lobotomy on rest and... and, and I, <laughs> uh, but but, but uh, the, the, impor the, import the important thing is that he is, that, that what he thinks other people critically situated might very well think. And that's why I'm asking you to explain the intellectual processes by which uh, this extraordinary demarche becomes possible. Well, I haven't read Scotty's piece, but I've that's read many pieces like it. That's said that. <laughs> yes. And, and well, I, you know, I, I don't I, think it's necessary I, to read I, the piece. I mean, oh, I'm quoting you the whole of the paragraph. Yes. That, this wasn't an article. So, so I can't be accused of quoting him out of yes. context. I'm quoting the whole of a little dispatch yes. that appeared on page two of the New York Times this morning. This is a live show, the University of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 aren't you concerned about this? I, well, I kind of take it for granted. I think that there's a tremendous vulnerability in uh, uh, what is called the American intellectual, uh, a vulnerability to anyone who sees his power in the name of the people. And if you run up a banner and say, I'm for the people, and, uh, uh, and I'm against the fellows who are against the people. Uh, Reston will run PR for you. Uh, I won't say this about Scotty, but, but there are a lot of folks who are really uh, uh, very much moved by that and don't ask the next question, what is he going to do for the people? And to what extent, when he gets in power, is he really working for the people or working to keep himself in power? Now, the tragedy of this whole sequence, since the French Revolution. And there's a whole sequence right down to Mao and the rest of them. Castro is a very good example. Is Undoubtedly, uh, just as uh, you go back and you read Mao's walks through the countryside of his native province in 1927, and he studied the miseries of those peasants, not because he had compassion for them as human beings, but because he understood the technically explosive right. political nature of that, those frustrations yeah. of living on the land. Now, he's a technician of power, and he got power, and he's got his red book, and he had his image, and, and he honestly believes, I'm sure, that what's good for Mao is good for the country. And I could say, you know, and then a man gets shifted over from what should he do for the people to how do I have to keep myself in power? It's a very old story. And, but there's something in our intellectual tradition that keeps people from accepting the reality of issues of power. Yeah. I remember uh, being struck by it in the 1950s when a great many intellectuals were against uh, Senator Kennedy and were for uh, Adlai Stevenson. And Adlai Stevenson was a good governor and a man who knew a lot about uh, politics and took it seriously. But his style was to make believe he was above politics, that all of this sort of power stuff in politics was unimportant. Now, he, he counted the votes just as well as anyone else. Uh, Senator Kennedy uh, had loved politics as a medium. He respected it. He, and was palpably interested in it, always semi-humorously, yeah. but that was the medium by which he got things done. And that offended a good many liberals at that time. And I think this, this, there is a very deep problem in our intellectual tradition 
And I can understand it in part as an academic with sympathy. It'd be, you know, much nicer if the world were run in terms of ideas. It'd be great if we could have operated the United States on the basis of the Declaration of Independence and didn't have to have that grubby negotiation at Philadelphia in which the big states and the small states and, and you know, you bargain the, the powers of the president and the, and, and the Bill of Rights. And uh, it's hard uh, for some intellectuals to face up to these realities of power. Now, the reason I'm not so upset is because I think our, what our people will draw from this is, is, well, maybe these fellas, and they understand it's been a bloody difficult thing. And, but if they're settling down a little, uh, they'll be skeptical about it. But if, if so, it's a good thing. Uh, if you look at the, despite all the propaganda in the war about the Soviet Union, the polls show that the American people as a whole remained rather skeptical that it'd work out after the war. Mm -hmm. Not because they were sort of compulsively anti-communist, but they remembered quite a lot and yeah. weren't taken in by slogans. Well, so I think that we'll sort out this ping pong business and, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and the trains run on time in China. Well, in, in, ter in terms of your own analysis as, as, as expressed in your book, uh, 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 if, if uh, 51 years after the Soviet Revolution, the Soviet Union is still prepared to send tanks into Czechoslovakia, to, uh, to abort and experiment in liberalism. Uh, what is it that causes you to think that less than 51 years from the time Mao Zedong uh, took over China, uh, he would, uh, would be required to cause him, let's say, to uh, uh, abdicate his interest in the politics of Thailand? I don't believe for a moment he's going to abdicate his interest. Uh, what I do think is that the experience of their economic failure relative to the rest of Asia, Japan notably, but others... Is absorbing their energy. ...that uh, they realize that, you know, uh, that, that uh, these great tricks of the, the Red Book and mobilizing the people, the Great Leap Forward, just didn't produce the goods. But other fellows are producing the goods and power. But don't they have That's an explanation for why it didn't? Don't they have an explanation? Uh, I think that they figure that it's, uh, well, as this fellow said in this cultural revolution, you need rational economic policy. The Chinese are not foolish people at all. Uh, very uh, uh, experienced and, uh, and well, shrewd yeah. people, and they know that this was a, uh, you know, uh, they've a rather fantastic with, idea that didn't work. Uh, they've experiment, experimented with ways of solving the population problem, no question about that. And, uh, <laughs> well, it, uh, they are also trying to move towards birth control of a sort. I understand what you're saying, too. But my point is that the change has come out of a series of very real experiences. The failure of the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, Soviet divisions... And we've just got to stay calm and, and, and let, let that thing work out. That's but, right. But, but not, not give them, not, not stimulate their appetite to lunge out in the old fashion. I think that's right. Yeah. And the meanwhile, talk with them temperately. I, I'm all for, uh, and always have been, as much uh, temperate dialogue as we could have, and we tried at Warsaw. Uh, regularly, and uh, if this is widening out, that's fine. Uh, but we should not think that Hicks history has been expunged. And Mr. Uh, I draw from what you've said about China and what I've been able to read of your book that one of the reasons for our continued presence in Southeast Asia would be to enhance the economic development of China. Is this correct? No, that's not the... I can see how you, you, you took the, that reading. The, what I said was that if we pull out now, as some would advocate, I think we are going to put China up against a tremendous temptation that it's likely in one way or another to move, and that would disrupt its present concentration on economic development, which is a slightly different way. It's not, and, and therefore, it would not help their internal situation if right. we didn't pull out. That's right. But is, is their internal situation or the well-being of the Chinese people the concern here, or is it the protection of some, in my mind, uh, not very well-defined uh, American interest? In it's, it's, it's the latter. I, don't, I, I, think that, uh, I think one of the effects would be to divert China from its present power. But you would not at all uh, make a move in a, with American military power unless it was judged to be in the American interest. Well, we don't have to move now. Uh, no, no, but... Uh, uh, well, well, the, you, you know, you, some people are urging that we tear up the CETO Treaty, the commitments to Thailand, and all the rest of it, you see, which well, I think could have a profound unsettling effect in Asia. The uh, thing that bothers me is that I'm unable to identify uh, 
uh, what you consider to be the American interests in, in Southeast Asia, unless uh, I'm allowed to say that all world problems are somehow to be defined as American problems. No, it's, it's the, I'd, I'd put it narrower. I'll try to do it tersely because this is your question period. I believe the balance of power in Asia hinges in part on who controls Southeast Asia. I believe the United States has an abiding interest that no single power control the balance of power in Asia. I believe, therefore, that it's an abiding American interest that the countries of Southeast Asia remain free. Now, if you want to know why, I'd give these reasons. There are about 300 million people who live there. It's about the size of uh, Africa or Latin America. Secondly, it commands the approaches, the sea approaches to Australia, uh, New Zealand, as well as the whole of, the, uh, of that area, Indonesia. And third, it, uh, it commands the approaches to the Indian Ocean. And fourth, it's a buffer between India and China. Uh, the highest placed Indian civil and military men have told me that for them the equivalent of the Ardennes for France, or the channel ports for Britain, is Burma. And therefore this whole area, I believe, in the interest of the United States and others, should be independent. Mr. Honig. Yes, Mr. Rostow. I would like to use your answer to this question and refer back to a, an earlier answer that you gave and ask you that if you believe that our presence in Southeast Asia will deter China from uh, some group of policies which you do not see as advantageous to world peace. And if our presence in Southeast Asia will deter Japan from going nuclear, as you put it, why will these things not be uh, deterred when we do get out of Southeast Asia, which we will soon? And why will our, why, why would you think that our getting out in two years will assure a more neutral Southeast Asia than our getting out now? Well, I don't know what uh, President Nixon plans by getting out and what, he, what forces he leaves, and above all, what commitments he leaves. One of the reasons why the, the two years versus the immediate get out is may, may be important. I don't know enough about the facts. But suppose Ambassador Bunker and General Abrams would say that over a two-year period, uh, the rate of buildup of the South Vietnamese uh, will permit us to handle this problem, anything the North Vietnamese can throw at them. But if you do it in a more hasty way, we'll lack this in this part of the country and that. I and think the way Japan? the United States handles the end of its operations in Vietnam will have a great effect on the judgment about America's reliability, not only in Thailand, but in Hanoi and Peking, and in Burma, and in Kuala Lumpur. So that uh, I think that uh, seeing this thing through uh, uh, in a way that uh, leaves behind, as President Nixon has said, uh, not chaos, but a stable peace. All right, I'll grant uh, you that. Makes, what about Japan? Makes a big though? difference. What about Japan? And why would, why would two years make a difference on there? Simply, uh, you know, the, re the re reliability of America as an ally, the substitute for going nuclear for countries like Japan, which palpably command the technical capacity, the substitute is reliance on the United States. But if we're out of Southeast Asia, where is their reliance on us? Well, uh, being out of, uh, of combat there does not, mean not that you, it. does not mean you abandon it. You may have military aid, you may have economic aid, you, uh, you could conceivably continue to have some naval forces. Uh, it doesn't mean that you've sought off and, and, and kissed the area goodbye. It means you've, uh, you've withdrawn U.S. troops from combat. At least that's the way I'd interpret it. Now, I cannot in any way speak for President Nixon's interpretation. And you still are keeping your treaty commitments to the other countries of the area, notably Thailand. Mr. Baird. Dr. Rostow, the last stage of your stages of growth talks about the search for quality. It's entitled The Search for Quality. Uh, what place does American military intervention on an international level, uh, what place does that have in this search for quality that you delineate? It's a necessary evil, in my view. I don't think any American military operation has, has any inherent virtue, or anybody's why, military virtue. Why doesn't it have an inherent virtue? Uh, I'm not, well, it's, it's a... If you're getting rid of the bad guys and pushing them back... No, which, I mean, it, it, like you that. may have to do it. it uh, to fight may be a lesser evil. Right. But it's, it's expensive, it's painful. That's right, and, and so it's the resource... Evil. The pe not evil. Uh, well, I, I mean that... Uh, was our expeditionary force to Europe to blot out Hitler evil? No, it was, but... It uh, was necessary pain, uh, but not evil, was it? 
Well, except killing to, is, killing, yeah, we had no, to kill killing civilians. Killing when you're up close is evil. Yeah. I mean, it, it may be necessary, and uh, and I'm not a pacifist, but I didn't not be a pacifist without be making quite a painful judgment about it. And I uh, still think killing is, is is a very bad thing. Painful. Uh, and worse. Uh, but the point is that uh, all of us would be delighted if we could go on and into this exploration of whether we can build a life of quality as the pressures of scarcity are lifted from us um, without having to allocate resources in men to military purposes. But we live in a world which is what it is. And it is what it is in part in terms of stages of growth because there are a lot of folks who are not in the search for quality. And they're not even up to high mass consumption or technological maturity. And they're coming up and gathering tech strength and uh, uh, as I say at one point, uh, politics may not abhor a vacuum, and there may not be outer barbarians beyond our gates. But if we and the other rich folk of the world slacken in our attention uh, to the world in our own protection, uh, there are people who'd like to move right in, not necessarily on us, but on areas that are of interest to us. So that uh, we bear inescapable responsibilities, in my view, Mort, for Despite the uh, tremendous attraction and, uh, of the problems of the search for quality, for trying to use our limited but real margin of influence uh, to keep this fragile planet of nations at very different stages of growth in some kind of order and progress. And uh, we, looking at the Middle East or Southeast Asia, you could say, uh, what a silly dream. On the other hand, if you look at the areas where we have achieved such islands of order and progress, and, uh, the North Atlantic and parts of the Pacific and uh, elsewhere in the world, you know the job isn't impossible. And I don't believe that uh, a Middle East settlement's impossible. I don't believe a settlement in Asia is impossible. I don't believe a success in, in the salt talks are impossible. But as I say in the book, the greatest danger, it seems to me, is American, excessive American withdrawal from responsibility. Do you think uh, international intervention will, will create any sort of hindrance to the domestic search for quality? And do you think there's a necessary hindrance there? Um, You're glad he asked you that question because you wrote a piece on that for the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think that the, um, no one <clears throat> wants to intervene, but the simple and remarkable truth of the period of the 60s is that Despite the war in Vietnam, our military expenditures as a proportion of gross national product fell over the decade, and didn't rise. And we achieved a 4% increase in the gross national product, public resources, state, federal, and local, going to social purposes. And that means a 4% shift while GNP was going up at 4 or 5%. So we conducted a social revolution. Now, uh, I begrudge every casualty in Vietnam and every dollar, and not only our own, but others. But the simple truth is that we managed a most remarkable shift in the allocation of resources, which didn't solve all our problems, but we wrestled with them. And we did it while the war was on. And I am not at all sure that a simple end to the war in Vietnam uh, would produce a big additional shift of resources to these purposes. I think we, uh, we're in a mood of taking stock now and asking, you know, uh, are all, you know, all this education necessary, all this health necessary, all this expenditure in the cities. We've had a, uh, an exhausting and energetic decade in which uniquely we faced war abroad and a social revolution at home and managed somehow to grapple with both. We're, and we're in a period of kind of reflection and stock taking. And this rhythm, which Arthur Schlesinger Sr. once first caught, is one that I think we're going through now. So I think that, uh, with a trillion dollar GNP and a sensible economic policy, we have plenty of resources to, to do the things in the search for quality that demand resources. But it means that there's got to be a political will and a confidence that you'll get results from them. Now, there are many aspects of the search for quality where resources won't solve it for you. And uh, some of those are the most interesting and ultimately most searching problems of this phase into which we've entered. Mr. Rappold. Uh, I'm wanting to come back a, a bit to some statements you made about the reasons for our continued presence in Southeast Asia. And again, about uh, just what interests are involved there. The, uh, 
the question is, uh, what, to begin with, what is, what is it that makes you feel that the countries in question, uh, South Vietnam or, uh, pardon me, South Vietnam is not a country, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, would be more independent, uh, pardon me, would not be more independent if uh, we were to pull out. That is to say, what makes you think? Apparently, the, the implication is that, that China would devour uh, the continent as some sort of a monster. Now, uh, what makes you feel that this is the case? Uh, what makes you feel that, uh, first, this would be possible uh, on the part of China, and secondly, that, that uh, the Chinese actually uh, would undertake? Well, while you're at it, would you handle the question of South Vietnam being a country? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's obviously as, uh, much of a country in exactly the same sense as South Korea or West Germany or... Uh, Which is not legally. Well, um, there, there, you never had a, a peace treaty in Germany, and you've never, you may get one, and you may be moving towards one, but you haven't got one. You, you haven't got one in Korea, you've got a truce, and you've got a truce. And, and, mm -hmm. A great many countries recognize South Vietnam uh, I, diplomatically. I they do. So, uh, so, I mean, but, you know, you've got a right to assert your own view of the matter, but diplomat international law takes a somewhat different view, including the Russians, who early in 1957 urged that these two countries be brought into the United Nations General Assembly. But yes, I, I'm aware of that, but in, in the technical point of international law, that is, there, there having been uh, an agreement uh, acceptable in a international law to separate Vietnam into two countries, to my knowledge, this, is not, uh, this has not taken place. This has not happened in Germany, it hasn't happened in Korea. So, sure, in that sense, it's in the same status as the others. Now to come back to your uh, uh, question. First, I think there's no doubt, uh, so far as South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia is concerned, uh, what the intention of Hanoi has been. It's been perfectly overt. The, the communist parties in Cambodia, Laos, South Vietnam, and North are one party. They have fronts, but they're one party, and it's always been that way, and we have the documents. We, so the, Hanoi's objective has been to take over the whole of the French colonial empire in Asia, and I don't think anyone doubts that. Now, of the China. Uh, I think that you've got to go back to 1965 to get a sense of the flavor of, of the Chinese ambition. Think of what it was like in early 65. Jakarta, the Indonesians had left the UN and openly said that it was joining a new club with Peking. The, uh, Lin Piao announced Thailand is next. Uh, the Malaysian confrontation was discussed along with the movement of the North Vietnamese in 65 very rapidly towards victory in South Vietnam as a nutcracker, as, a, uh, the, uh, as the, the phrase used by, on the 17th of August 1965 by Sukarno was a pincer movement Peking, Pyongyang, Hanoi, Phnom Penh, uh, Jakarta. And they almost pulled it off. And if you go back and read the newspapers and see what Menzies was saying and uh, uh, what the prime minister in uh, Kuala Lumpur was saying, and uh, this was not, uh, you know, domino theory wasn't a theory in 65. <laughs> yeah, the dominoes came within an ace of falling and everyone knew it. And then President Johnson moved. Now, behind all, uh, and, and then the whole thing began to change. The Cultural Revolution uh, happened in China in some kind of obscure relationship to this setback in Indonesia. But my point is, if you go back to that period, there was no obscurity about what uh, Mao's ultimate interests were in Southeast Asia. Now, I don't believe that's the only policy. If he, if he can't get it without a war, I don't think he wants a war with the United States. On the other hand, it, the only force capable of deterring the Chinese ground forces, which are massive, backed by a nuclear force, which is unique in Asia, is the possibility of tangling with the United States. So that I, I honestly believe that, that uh, you're, you're tempting these fellows intolerably if you pull out. It's an area in which they have an interest, and uh, if we leave a vacuum, I think they'll move into it. And I don't, I'm not inclined to be moralistic about it. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Rostow, um, in the few minutes we have before closing, I'd like to uh, um, ask you, uh, in your book, whether the criticism uh, of it is just. 
that it leaves the reader of it without a secure sense of what, in fact, you are predicting for different countries. I mean, that, that, that however, however satisfactory and even appetizing your description of what went before goes, one can't simply say, on the basis of my knowledge of Mr. Rostow's thesis, I, I can confidently say that the, the following is going to happen in Latin America in the next 40 or 50 years. How, how do you reply to that criticism? Uh, I'd say that in part it's false, in part it's true. It's false because uh, as much as uh, politics uh, is a science, and I'm more inclined to regard it as an art or a biological science than a Newtonian science, what I do suggest is that there are typical patterns of problems that go with different stages of growth. And you can see similar patterns in politics in late 18th century and contemporary Africa. And I think that uh, I would say, uh, we'll have to see whether I'm right, uh, whether there is a, uh, the kinds of patterns of political problems that I associate with stages will persist as other countries move forward in the stages. Now we've already had uh, a little test, at least, of the book, even though it's just out. Uh, it was finished more than a year ago. Uh, I did forecast, in a gentle way, the possibility that you might see China turn towards internal uh, affairs and move out in a more temperate way in the world scene. I said I couldn't see much uh, in uh, the Middle East, except I noted this convulsive movement of the Fedayeen, which failed in 1970. But we have had Sadat talking to his own people about the primacy of the modernization of education, which for me is a kind of hopeful fire bell in the night. Uh, so there are some predictions. The sense in which I'd say the critics are right is the sense that I have great respect for politics. Uh, it's just as complicated as human beings. And therefore, I would never pretend to uh, predict precisely, uh, you know, the way you predict uh, the way uh, yeah. uh, fellows are coming back from the moon and what spot the stuff. But uh, in an, if you say that uh, it's not going to help you on that, correct. But I, uh, I, I think maybe it will give you a sense of the, of the way things will evolve politically in countries. I, and uh, do, you, do you think that one of the things that will evolve is the recognition that Lyndon Johnson was a great president? I believe, yes, he will. I think that will come. I think that uh, what he once said to me, casually, uh, will turn out to be true. Uh, we were in his office, and this is a very rare thing in the working day for a president to philosophize. He, he was looking at the ticker, and without turning his back, he said, I believe that uh, my grandchildren will be proud of me for two things, what I did for the Negro in this country and what I did in Asia. But right now, I've lost 10 points in, in the polls, and I'm Thank you, Mr. Rostow. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Johnson. On the race question. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the panel. printed copy of this program, send 25 cents in coin, no stamps please, to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. That's 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.